I'm taking their places. That would be great. It is 535. And we want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for everyone. Can you hear me? If you can hear the clock, what? Aton, are we good? I don't yeah, like hearing my voice now. It's the weirdest thing. Mr. Crab? Oh, and the Madam President is also here. Aton, did you respond to me? Did I do that? Oh, jump in, okay. Yes, I did. <sighs> We have a few reunions happening today. Some new faces, it's all good. We have another, you have the other. So good evening everyone. Welcome to another in our series of the Forum for a Hate Free Vermont that is uh, co-run by the Rutland Area Branch of the NAACP, the Vermont Attorney General's Office, and the U.S. Attorney General of the U.S. Attorney's Office. <laughs> uh, we've been doing this since 2019, and I and I thought this was our last one, but <laughs> just found out it's not. We'll be doing another one in Chittenden County. So uh, if you have any friends up there, um, tell them to be on the lookout for some app for some some time. So my name is Tabitha Moore. I am the. This is really tripping me. Up. I am the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee for the Rutland Area Branch of the NAACP. I am one of your co-facilitators tonight. My other co-facilitator is online. He's going to introduce himself really quickly. Hi, my name is Eitan Nasred and Longo. I am a co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs for the State Police. And I am also chair of the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel because he doesn't have enough to do. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Before we get too far into things, we wanna make sure that you have what you need in this space to be able to participate. One of the things that Aton and I like to do as co-facilitators is list some community agreements that are now behind these imposing boards behind me. <laughs> but, uh, so these are the things that we like for people to keep in mind as we go about having these difficult conversations. Recognizing that hate is a form of trauma for people who are on the receiving end of it. We want to make sure that we create a space where folks feel welcome and like you can say what you need to say without uh, fear of judgment or attack. So the first community agreements is that, is that we invite you to speak your experience. That means that we try to encourage people to use I statements and talk about what's going on for you. Um, we ask that you take space and make space, meaning you are welcome to share. Each participant will be given about five minutes to start with and recognizing that, um, you know, again, your stories may be traumatic for you. I will try to give you a warning before time is up, just so we can at least hear from everybody before we do a second round. Um, we ask that you listen to understand. Nobody's here necessarily to attack anybody else, just to share what you need to say so that our uh, service providers and government have a sense of places that we can be stronger and better um, in terms of meeting your needs. So listen to understand. Hate speech and threats will be interrupted by me. We understand that some topics, particularly related to identity, can bring about strong emotions for folks. And we want to recognize and honor that everybody has a different uh, opinion or experience, but we will not allow anybody to levy threats or to say anything that is going to harm somebody else. We ask that you take the learning and leave the story. That means that you might hear something that is particularly powerful or impactful to you, and that's something that you want to be able to take forward and share as you are in community with one another. We think that's fine as long as you don't give anybody else's identifying information away, like, oh, Charity said blah, 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 blah. Um, unless you have explicit permission, just take what you learn from this experience and keep going. Uh, without sharing uh, people's stories. That's also the biggest yeah, rule. That's the Tabitha. Oh, okay. And that is take care of yourself. Yes. These kinds of traumatic 
experiences that may well be um, expressed during this event uh, can be such that you need a moment to yourself with the either with your camera off or out of the room where everybody is. Please be mindful of that because we are also concerned that everyone be well, simply be well. This is difficult enough. And if you need to take time for yourself, please do so. Thank you. And if something comes up for you and you need to chat with somebody, uh, many of us stay after um, at the end. And I'm gonna introduce the service providers to you briefly in a moment. Um, I feel like there's one other, but I guess that was our last one, wasn't it, Aton? Yeah. All yeah, right, so that, that being said, I just wanna turn your attention really quickly. Our friends from Orca Media uh, are here today and we've seen them over a few fora. I don't know if you've um, heard about any, but we tend to have some coverage. So Orca is here today to try to capture the spirit of what's going on. They also have somebody who is in our um, um, online Zoom group as well. So if you are uncomfortable being recorded um, and you speak, please just say, I am not comfortable being recorded. And um, they will make sure to do what they can to protect your, your information, okay? That being said, are there any accessibility needs? Does anybody have anything? Um, is the sound okay for folks? All right, restrooms for folks who are in this space. The restrooms are that way. <laughs> oh. First hall on the left. First hall on the left. Okay, so if anybody needs to restroom, food and drinks are over here. Hello, okay. This is not too far away. Are over there, and please let me know if there's anything that you need to be in space throughout the evening. So that being said, I am just going to say the names of each of our, uh, our leaders who are with us today. From the FBI, we have Supervisory Special Agent Brant Gage. From the U.S. Attorney's Office, I just saw him walk in, where do you go? Nicholas Karest and Jules Torty. From the Vermont Attorney General's Office, we have Charity Clark, Eric Jacobson, and Julio Thompson. And oh, where'd you go? That. Where she go? Is she over there? Okay. And then uh, Human Rights Commission couldn't make it, but and Barb isn't here, right? No. And then locally, you have some, did I miss anybody else in terms of our federal or state level partners who are in this room? Did I say Gabby? Oh, hi. <laughs> this is, yeah, Gabby. Gabby's the most amazing person who makes sure that all of this comes together. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> Okay, she's critical to this whole piece. Thank you. Locally, we have Chief Scott Kluart. Did I say that right? All right. <laughs> Lisa Flight, who's co-principal here at Randolph, and Lane Millington, who is the superintendent. Did I miss any other community partners before I introduce one more person? <laughs> Heather Lawler. Excellent, thank you, Heather, who is the Assistant Superintendent and Equity Director for the district here. Thank you, welcome. One more person that I absolutely have to introduce is my president, <laughs> Rutland Area Branch President, Mia Schultz. So she is joining us in person here today. Did I miss anybody else? Excellent. So over here, you'll see our agenda. We've just done the introductions, so we're doing great. We did our community agreements and media acknowledgement. So what we're going to do next is an overview of services where, who's going to go first? Do we decide? Should we flip for it? Okay, Julio, you're nodding too enthusiastically. So Julio Thompson from the Vermont Attorney General's Office is going to present first, followed by Jules Torty from the U.S. Attorney's Office. And then if you want to be able to say anything, you're more than welcome here to listen. Yeah. Okay. So, we're co-presenting now. Um, Jules Torty, I'm with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, we are uh, the Federal Department of Justice presence in Vermont. Um, 
So if you think about uh, federal laws being enforced, you know, you've heard of like a federal prosecution for bank robbery or drugs. We also enforce civil rights laws, and that can be uh, civil, uh, civil rights laws, like anti-discrimination laws and employment and housing. It can also be criminal civil rights laws, which are things like are hate crimes or when um, uh, officers of the law abuse their power. So that's who I am, and that's the office that I'm a part of. And I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general and director of the civil rights unit in the attorney general's office. We are the uh, lead, or the, the largest law enforcement uh, office in the state. We have a criminal division, an environmental law division, uh, public uh, protection, consumer protection division, uh, as well as civil rights. Uh, we enforce, among other things, the state uh, anti-discrimination laws when it comes to employment. So people who have problems in their workplace can come to us and we can investigate those cases, mediate conflicts, and try to reach uh, a result that works for everyone. Uh, we also uh, work with our criminal division and our county prosecutor's offices on enforcing Vermont's hate crime laws. I'll talk a little bit about what hate crimes are and what they're not. Uh, and we also have civil enforcement, so we have the authority to go to court, seek a court order to keep someone, perhaps from harassing someone on the basis of who they are, who they worship, and so forth. Uh, and Jules and, also, and I also teach at the uh, Vermont Police Academy, so uh, all the new police officers who come out uh, go through the class that we teach, we teach together along with uh, a victim's advocate who works directly with people who are affected by acts of hate. So I think I'll stop right there. Should we turn to it? Yeah. yeah, so I think um, to provide a f like framework and for what we're gonna talk about today, um, we like to go through what we call this like bias, inc ooh, bias incident pyramid. And I'm just gonna move it up a little bit because I know folks over there can't see it. So um, as I said, I, I work in the civil rights field and our office takes in complaints. So something I hear all the time is someone calls or submits a letter and says, I've been the victim of a hate crime. Hate crime is like a buzzy word. It's a word we hear a lot. Um, and it's not folks' job to know what like the legal label is for what happened to them. Um, but in fact, a, a very little of what I hear about qualifies as a hate crime. So we're gonna be throwing around terms today like hate crime, civil rights violation, I want to give some folks a little bit of a you know framework for w how we're using those words. So when something bad, oh thank you, Aaron is gonna Vanna White the situation. Oh, oh on the great. yeah, it's great. Thank you. Oh. Like this. So when something bad happens to someone on the basis of who they are, their identity, their race, their sexual orientation, their gender identity. Um, all, all folks really know is that something bad has happened to them. We call it a bias incident. Um, and bias incidents can be a lot of different things. They can be crimes. You could get punched in the face uh, because of your, some aspect of your identity. Uh, and, and that's a crime. Um, you know, you have your property destroyed. That's a crime. Crimes are punishable by going to jail, uh, among other things. Um, but something else could happen to you that feels bad because of some part of your identity. But it's not a crime, like no one got hurt, no one's property got destroyed, no one was threatened, um, but maybe you didn't get that promotion. Maybe you're not getting equal education uh, in your school because of how you look or some part of your identity. Um, and that could be a civil rights violation. There are federal and state laws that protect people from being treated differently based on who they are uh, in a way that's not a crime, but, but still violates the law. Um, and our office, and Julio's office, I should say Charity and Colo's office, because we do have the heads of both of those offices here, um, enforce the criminal and civil laws that protect folks, uh, folks' civil rights. Um, so as you'll see at the top, hate crimes, crimes most severe, but really the least frequent. In this middle category, we have these anti-discrimination laws, or what we call civil rights violations. Um, but at the bottom is the largest group uh, of incidents, and you'll see that they're labeled lawful, lawful bias-motivated incidents. So a lot of what happens to people, I think probably most of what happens to people, that is like a negative, bad, traumatic experience based on folks' identity, is actually not against the law at all. 
And there are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is the First Amendment and free speech. Um, but it, it remains that a lot of what happens to folks um, is not something that lawyers can help you with. Um, and so one of the reasons we do community forums like this is to talk about how lawyers can help, how the law can help you, and how to get in touch with your state and federal officials when something bad happens. But part of it is also to talk about everything down here, the stuff that can be traumatic, that can change your experience in the world, um, where there, there's not a law that makes it illegal, and to talk about what the community does to respond those, to those sorts of incidents. Um, one thing that I really try to underscore is that just because something isn't against the law, it doesn't make it like less bad, less traumatic, less important. Um, so a lot of times like folks will contact our office or, or the state AG's office, and sometimes there's nothing that we can do legally to help. Um, but Julia will talk about some ways that we, that we try to still be able to help. Um, but uh, you know, it's not a referendum on whether the thing that happened was bad. Um, it's, just a, it's just a different way of treating it. So with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Julio, who's gonna talk about um, something I've touched on a little bit, reporting. Like when one thing happens to you that falls anywhere in this pyramid, uh, what do you do and who do you talk to and what might happen? So I don't, I don't know um, how many of you have had direct involvement with your state or federal government or even your local government on a problem. Historically, here in Vermont and pretty much everywhere else in the country, people who work in government are given rules about what their job is and what falls within what they can do for the public. And maybe it's because of the way that large organizations work. Maybe it's because of history and culture. But for a long time, and that includes in Vermont, people came to someone with a problem, and the government servant is, doesn't have the power to address that problem. Often the experience is simply, I'm sorry, that's not my department. It's nothing we can do for you, and have a nice day, and maybe give them a phone number for them to try their luck in the next part of government. That's the way it's worked for many, many years. And in the area of bias incidents, often it would happen this way. If something would happen in the community, people would be upset, but it might not be a crime. They go to the police department, the officer finds out what happens, and they can either tell right away that it's not a crime, or maybe they send it to the county prosecutor who decides it's not a crime, nothing a prosecutor can do, they can't take the case to court, they might get a letter explaining there's nothing that the prosecutor can do because it's not a crime. And often that's the end of the matter. Um, and for several years now, our office, the Attorney General's office, working with the U.S. Attorney's office, and working with some other government agencies, have said, we can do a little bit better than that. That if we get something to us that's not a crime, rather than wishing people a nice day or saying, sorry, it's the First Amendment, there's nothing we can do. We are trying to reimagine what we're doing and deciding whether we or someone else can help the person who's harmed. Just because the First Amendment says you can't arrest somebody or take them to court doesn't mean that you can't help the community or the person who's victimized by the conduct. There's nothing that stops the First, the first Amendment doesn't stop us from reaching out to the community to try to address that harm. The, really, the, the only limit really is our imaginations, our, our contacts with the community, and our willingness to help. And so we created something in our office a few years ago called the Bias Incident Reporting System. And it's a voluntary system among the county prosecutors and Vermont's police agencies, and there are over 80 police agencies in Vermont, where if someone comes to the police department with a complaint about some act of hate in the community, we just ask the police department to share that information with us in the Civil Rights Unit. If they did an incident report, just send it to us. Because it might be an unsolved crime. We, we have a description of someone, a description of his car, they did something that wasn't a crime, so they're not going to pursue a criminal investigation. But it could be that a week, a month, a year sometimes, 
we hear from a different police department a description of somebody in the same car who committed a hate crime. A hate crime is a criminal act that's motivated by bias against someone because of who they are. So one thing that we try to do is get that information from different parts of the state so that maybe, just maybe, we can help folks connect the dots. And maybe the detectives who are working on cases can talk to each other from different parts of the state and try to connect the dots together. That's one thing we're trying to do. The other thing is that something might not be a crime, but it might be something like employment discrimination. Well, we do employment discrimination cases, so if the police tell us about something that happened at someone's work, they bring it to us, we'll assign an investigator and start working on that right away. But we can't work on that unless the police or the community shares the information with us. The other thing we try to do is for cases that aren't going to court, no one's getting arrested, no one's being sued, for that large uh, component of these lawful bias motivated incidents, the question is, if we aren't the ones to do anything, we can't go to court, judge will throw us out of the courtroom, who in our community can help? So we've got folks here who work in the areas of community and restorative justice, who may be just the professionals to work on that. Sometimes we talk to librarians, we talk to educators, we talk to faith leaders. We are trying to find out the right group of people who can address a problem. Because as, as much as we like to help, we realize that sometimes when someone shows up in a suit looking like me, I'm exactly the wrong person to be there. That I am, I am gasoline on the fire rather than someone who can help. So we're trying to work with communities to find out who out there is in the community who has the resources and the interest to be able to work with us on the bias incident reporting system. Now, you're all a little far away, um, so I do have this chart here that maybe you'll come take a look at later, where we show you the different agencies that we might refer you to. For example, if it's a problem with housing, you have a neighbor who's treating you poorly, um, but it's not a crime, there's an agency called the Vermont Human Rights uh, Commission that does that. The federal government does that as well. Uh, if it's an area of public accommodation, which includes schools, restaurants, theaters, the highways, uh, anywhere, government offices, if you're facing discrimination there, the Human Rights Commission can also do that. But it's not your job to find like which piece uh, of the picture that, or puzzle that you need to, to fit. The idea is for it to come to us, and that we'll be the ones to work with you. We have a victim's advocate in our office we can talk about additional needs you, you have to make sure that you feel safe and that your employer uh, knows what you're going through. Because Vermont protects uh, crime victims, so if you're having problems at work, we can find folks to be able to help you out. So I'll stop right there. We have a couple questions already in the chat. The first question, and I guess. Yes. You, you got it, Tabitha? We do. Yeah, Gabby's on everything. Okay. Okay, so the question, what if the bias stems from police activity? Does your office also address this? And so essentially, does the bias reporting system apply to police? It, it does. Vermont's public accommodation laws include policing. So if there's a complaint against a police agency, and if that came into us directly, we would, you know, have our advocate most likely talk to the person who made the complaint to see if they're comfortable talking with the Vermont Human Rights Commission, um, which can do an investigation, and they do cases uh, to investigate claims of discrimination against the police department. And Jules, you want to talk about the federal counterpart? Yeah, there are there are federal, civil, and criminal laws that apply to law enforcement. So um, we can investigate police departments for patterns and practices of abuses of, of people's rights. Um, we can also prosecute a police officer who under, under the power of his or her office um, violates someone's rights in a criminal way. And there's a few other federal laws um, that we can use to, to look at police activity. So um, it's, it's a, like a bit of a patchwork, I think, between the federal and the state laws, but from a criminal and a civil perspective, yeah, civil rights laws absolutely apply to police officers. Was, was that a question on this as a follow-up? Uh, would you repeat the original question? Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. I can repeat it verbatim. So can you scroll I think that down? Mic might be it. Yeah. All right. What if the bias stems from police activity? Does your office also address this? Yeah, 
and I would add that our office also can criminally prosecute uh, police officers, as can the state's attorneys, if they commit a crime. Yeah. So pres we're good with the presentation? Yeah. Any other questions based on the presentation before we get into folks talking about some of your experiences? And things may come up as we go too, so thanks Jules and Julio. All right, so we wanted to make sure that you had that background going into this next part, especially if you're going to be talking about an experience that you would like to um, talk to our partners about. That being said, we really want to know more about what it is that you experience. How are you feeling in your community? Um, do you have experiences with hate? Now, I mean, we're, we're not gonna pretend that we're not in Randolph where you've been a little bit under, under some scrutiny lately. There's been a lot going on and we know that people have all kinds of feelings and, and thoughts about that. We're really interested in hearing about your experiences and thinking about how these, these uh, folks in government might be able to support. Please keep in mind our community agreements. That being said, is there anybody that wants to lead off Okay. If not, I have a whole cadre of questions. It's part of being a therapist. Hi, I'm Kristen Chandler. I live here in Randolph. And I think um, my kids went to this high school. And I think one of the things that's really struck me is about the divisiveness that's happened here over the last four or five years, specifically um, racial bias and transphobia stuff is is been um, it has been that we're not used to being a divided community I don't it hasn't been my experience living here 20 years that we've had what now feels like a real demarcation with uh, between two two groups of people and it's just sort of hard to figure out how to how to uh, there's been a lot of efforts to try to make people come together to the table and work things out and can't we all just get along and it feels like um, it hasn't really worked and it still feels painful to live here. Thank you. Anybody else? Does that ring true for you? I see Mia looking at you. She better make you say something. <laughs> Um, so I got a couple things I can touch on, but right now, while I have your guys' attention, and because I was <laughs> made aware there's an FBI agent here, um, I want to bring you guys aware just to something real quick. Can you put um, the mic near your mouth? So of course. And this definitely goes along with what we're talking about. With um, this is definitely a racially motivated thing. Um, it's not. It's not for Randolph. This actually happened in Barrie, um, but I think everybody should know about this too because it's very close to where we are and the suspected killer is still on the loose so i mean that's something that everyone should think about with this story um about three years ago there was a young man by the name of ralph g marie who uh was killed and went missing in a hotel room in the hollow end hotel which is right in the middle of barry city um he was he was black and his peers were all white. Um, he had an ex-girlfriend there, and I want to say three or four other individuals in the room with him. Um, on camera, they were all seen walking into the room on camera, and there was never any video footage of Ralph ever leaving that room. Um, later on down the road, there was footage of some of those people leaving out and coming back with a large bag and leaving out with a large bag big enough to fit a body in. Um, now here we are three years later, I'm still telling you guys the story, and there has been no kind of uh, investi really no investigation, no new news, no nothing for the family, no closure to this. Um, honestly, the community, uh, me, 
Uh, we've been putting a documentary together for this, for this whole storyline that's been going on. And we've actually been the ones that put in the investigation as far as getting people from Idaho to come down with gear to go down into the quarries and bury. Because there was a story that he might have been dumped, his body might have been dumped in there. The police have been on record to say that they completely dropped the ball. They did not do their jobs on this. Like when this all happened, they never investigated. The, they went to the room. There was they didn't ask for uh, videotape footage. If any of you guys know, most businesses their tapes run on a continuous basis. So like after a day or two, the recordings are recorded over. So that footage was lost. They never went to recover the footage. They never asked any neighbors. At the, at the hotel or across the street at the house if they see anything, heard anything suspicious, anything. Um, throughout the throughout these three years now, people have come forth with information to the police, Barry police, nothing. They, they haven't taken any follow-ups. Uh, the four suspects that were in the room, they were, I mean, mildly questioned in the beginning for a couple of days, but none of them were really like, I mean, this is a murder investigation and, and a person missing. And I mean, they, they act like it was just like a, just a regular domestic fight in the room and everything was okay. But this is a man who's missing. I mean, he has kids, he has a mother, cousins, family, everything. And we're still fighting to this day. We're putting all the work. We just, we just put up money to get cadaver dogs to come up and, but this is three years later now we're doing all this. And we're doing this, the community. Like the police have no interest in, in trying to help out. They say, oh, we're doing this, we're doing, but they haven't. I mean, we've caught them in every lie. So, I mean, they haven't tried to go out to get other agencies to come in and help. I mean, I know how murder investigations work. I know how disappearance work. I know once that, once that immediate uh, unit can't figure it out, they go outside and get the help. They haven't made any effort. So, I mean, mm. it's, it's just sad. And we're still to this day working on this every single day, so. Just wanted to bring a little awareness to that. Just to let you guys know, I mean, this is Barry. You know, Barry's only 20 minutes from here. The person that did this is still walking the streets, living their life. So, that, just think about the mindset that that says now. Oh, I can go to Barry. If I get mad, I can go kill someone in Barry and get away with it. I'm fine. They're not going to investigate a crime, especially if I go kill a black person. Me, I got to sit home at home and think about that. I got my kids and my family here now. What happens that happens to me? I don't have family here. I, I would hope somebody would try to put the effort in to come find me. So that's that. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for bringing him to this space. I'm sure that his family appreciates you being here tonight. So from our law enforcement partners, I have a question if that's okay. What can we do in a situation such as this? What are the options? I'm gonna come get that. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm the uh, supervisor special agent for the FBI here in Vermont. Uh, I cover down on all the criminal programs that the FBI runs in the state. Uh, one of the main factors that we would do in a situation like that is work with police, uh, police cooperation case. Uh, I haven't heard anything about this case. This is definitely something I can look into and have a conversation with Barry PD and just kind of see where they're at with it. Uh, but in generally, when you have something that you're wondering where to go with it and what to do with it, we have an FBI tips line that you can just access via the internet. Um, you can type in information and it will find its way to us. I do go through about 10 of these a day to get reference to the state of Vermont, specifically my office. So it is something that we do see. Um, not always can we do everything. We don't always open full cases on everything that we come in that comes in through that portal, but we do look at them and I do address them and I do find some sort of resolution, whether it may not be a federal resolution, but it's at least a conversation gets started with somebody, I'd say 90% of the time. So that would be the first thing that I would comment on. That's kind of where we stand with it. I mean, that just begs the question then, though. Um, what do you do when your local law enforcement is not doing their due diligence and you think it's related to some sort of bias? Because we know that if this was a young white woman who came up missing and they had videotape, there would be all sorts of 
law enforcement, press, all sorts of attention to this. So what do we do when our local law enforcement doesn't um, use the same sort of diligence for people of color? And this is to all of you. Uh, so if there's a complaint about discriminatory policing or the lack of policing on the basis of someone's race, that <clears throat> if a police department's doing that, that would be a violation of Vermont's public accommodations law. Uh, uh, someone can go to, you come to our office, which doesn't have that authority, we'll work with you to get you to the Human Rights Commission where they will assign an investigator or an investigative team uh, to look into what's going on. Um, and if there's a way to work out informally, so it's something that uh, there's some way to resolve the conflict. Uh, the Human Rights Commission has very skilled mediator, mediators who work on those things, or they can uh, investigate the police department and if necessary, take them to court. Uh, if there's not a way to reach justice outside of court. Um, and uh, Jules mentioned earlier, um, you know, the US Department of Justice has authority to uh, investigate police departments that you know, over time, uh, display a pattern or practice of discriminatory treatment. Um, right now, I don't speak too much for the federal level, but um, the, there are any number of ongoing investigations all over the country right now uh, into those very allegations. Um, I recently was in touch with a Suffolk University uh, professor who was looking at a police department's um, handling of 911 calls and how they assess uh, what is truly a priority call. And there are concerns in that community that calls from certain parts of the community, and those are often communities of color um, or people who are uh, English language learners, are not getting the priority. And so they have, um, they're taking a careful look at that right now. So there is that federal um, option on the pattern and practice as well. Thank you. Oh. Can you hear? Okay, and let's go back to Sean. Just really quickly, I think one of the things that I'm hearing um, from our two folks here is one thing that they don't want to hear is if they do call the FBI or the Human Rights Commission or the Vermont Attorney General's office is, well, we, we talked with the local agency and they said that they've done as much as they can. So if you are going to be an agency that when they call you, and say, hey, our local police aren't doing what they can, I would advise against calling them back with that response. Because number one, it may erode trust even further. Number two, we know that sometimes local investigations are not good, as we've just heard, right, anecdotally. And number three, to build that trust, tell them what you've done. Tell them what you're doing to make sure that the investigation is being handled properly. Is that accurate now? All right, go ahead, Sean. You know, it's funny, you know, this brother right here, because I just, you know, I just seen your documentary the other day, and it just brought me back to a situation that happened around the same time in Burlington with a kid, uh, Keith Gaston, who police said that they jumped, he jumped off the bridge into the river, and they can't find his body. And I think I mentioned this before, but I haven't had heard anything about it. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, um, would there be any way for someone to find that out? Whatever happened to his body? Because it was the same situation where it seemed like no one really cared about where his body was. The answer that I got was his body got washed away into, the, into Lake Champlain. And I don't know if anyone even went out there to look for his body or anything. And no one got any answers or anything. It just was like no one done anything. So I guess I'm just on here to find out if I can get some answers about that. Anyone, anyone going to take that up? Is there anyone that can and that's in the space? Who would they go to?
Yeah, Sean, I, it, um, BPD, right, is the Burlington Police Department. Police. But they're the ones, I think, that you, you say how you haven't gotten the answers from. I think, um, I think it's hard because, you know, we know that black communities are not only over police, but can be under, under protected by the law. So when something happens, I understand the suspicion. I, I can't speak for BPD, I don't know this incident. Um, but, you know, I, I acknowledge where you're coming from and I, and I understand why you would be suspicious of, of what you're hearing from law enforcement. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think anyone in this room though like knows the case or has an answer here. Um, but we can, we can chat after if you wanna stick around. Aton? Yes, um, I have a comment here um, on a slightly different topic that um, I've been asked to share. The person who has written it is unwilling to do it themselves, um, feeling that they do not want to out themselves. So I will read it and um, I hope it has an impact. One thing that has been challenging for me as an educator in town is that I know we have some students who are LGBT and that the trans students are regularly misgendered by their peers and even by colleagues. While I want to assume best intentions, it happens frequently and I feel more frequently of late, which makes it hard to feel these best intentions. Whether people believe in us or not, I want the community to know how harmful and dangerous this can be for our community members. Trans individuals and particularly trans people who are members of the global majority are victims of violence as well as suicide on a far higher rate than that of our cisgendered peers. One of the most effective ways we can help people feel safe and actually make them safe from others is by recognizing people for who they are, gendering and naming them appropriately. I have a, I have a comment on that actually. Oh, sir, did you have your hand up? Because I wouldn't want to take your space. Did you have your hand up? Me? Yeah. No, just scratch my oh. ear. <laughs> yeah. So this person said that um, they were in the school, and you know, I want to leave the official school policy to Superintendent Millington, who's here. Um, but um, our office works a bit with with schools on, on bullying cases. Um, and from that experience, you know, I want, want to encourage this person um, just to absolutely report any incident of misgendering or slurs that they hear. Every school in Vermont has a system for investigating incidents of hazing, harassment, or bullying. Does it always work how it's supposed to? I see Mia's face. No, it does not. But it can't work if people are not making those complaints. And I hear in this person's voice read through Aton, like wanting to assume good intentions. And I love that, but I also know that um, it's impossible to judge these things from the outside. And, um, you know, the more the school knows about what's going on, the more that they can respond. So maybe someone accidentally misgendered someone and hopefully, you know, some of the school will look into that and, you know, the truth will come out. And if they did intentionally misgender someone, the school has a chance to address it. So, um, you know, parents, teachers, educators, I know it can feel so strange to like report someone, um, but I do think having, giving schools, like equipping them with the knowledge uh, of what's going on in their school community so they can look into it um, is one of the best tools that we have, imperfect, but one of the best tools we have to address um, this sort of bullying or harassment. Is it working? Yep. Yeah. Actually, usually, usually I don't need it anyway, but um, um, Lane Milling from Superintendent. Oh, you got to keep it up just because there's some folks that can't hear. Yep. Gotcha. Um, I think the, the, the biggest thing that we face right now um, is exactly what you spoke about, is the lack of reporting. Um, but that lack of reporting is combined with, with fear of reporting. Um, and so it's one of the things that we're working on in terms of trying to get the kids uh, to have a comfortable space where they can come and they can talk and they can reveal these things to us so that we can check on them. Um, 
I am in kind of the same boat where, you know, I want to assume the positive, um, but I also know after the last couple of months that that's not always true. And the only way to find out the truth is, is to be able to, to hear from folks and to be able to investigate it. Um, so it's real important. But if there are good ideas that come out tonight, especially about reducing that fear so that people can feel more comfortable reporting, I want to hear them. Um, because I think that's our, our, our biggest issue that we've got right here. Thank you. We have an online question and then we're going to come here. Um, yeah, Mr. Bilowski, I tried, sorry. <laughs> can we unmute him, please, so he can ask his question? Oh, thank you. I think, yes, thank you did get it correct. Um, thank you. Uh, actually, a lot of people don't get it correct, so thanks for that. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Polish. Uh, in any case, my question is just about, it's actually in the comments, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, does your office deal with enforcing the compelled speech doctrine? This is a principle part of the First Amendment of our Constitution that deals with no one should ever be uh, forced to believe anything on any issue that that person does not agree with. And, and I might note, um, well, on my speaking candidly, I, I think this can affect people on both sides of the issues. We don't want um, people on the far right or the far left in any institution taking some of their core beliefs and saying this is a condition of employment or this is a condition of being able to attend the school and so on and so forth. So I think we could all, and frankly, whether you agree with it or not, it's part of the first amendment of our constitution. So can you comment on how does your office deal with this aspect of the law, um, the can FBI or, or any law enforcement for that matter? Okay, okay. So thank you. <laughs> Did we, did we catch the question? So the, the question is, do you, does your office um, respect the, well, the First Amendment, the compelled speech doctrine is the other part. We always hear about the free speech part. Uh, you know, we were able to say what we believe. The other half of that is the compelled speech doctrine is nobody should be forced to believe anything that they don't believe. So do, does your office, uh, I, my question would be, does your office enforce this and how does it do so? So most First Amendment enforcement really does happen in the private context, just, you know, like looking historically and in, in, in uh, modern day, um, there are certain federal laws that authorize our office, the, the DOJ, to address usually um, patterns and practices of constitutional violations. So like, you know, I would, we would always have to look at the thing that's happening and look at the law and figure it out. But that's the framework um, for our office if there was any constitutional violation um, that we would be looking at. Just for, for purposes of quoting you in my article, that you, thank you for your answer. You're, you again are, your, your title, your name? Oh, uh, Jules Torty from okay, the US Attorney's you. Office. Thank you for your answer. And Michael, what news agency are you from? I'm sorry, I usually say it when I introduce myself, True North Reports, we're just a small independent outlet. Yes, um, all right, thank you so much. Thank you. And Michael Bolowski, right. right, thank you. Okay, great, so we, I don't know if you were here in the beginning, but we um, had done a quick intro for our friends in the media. And so again, just a reminder to folks, if you do not want to be recorded, well, I mean, with the exception of our partners, right? If you are a community member in attendance and would prefer not to be quoted, you can certainly right. say I that as you that offer part. your... I heard that. I did a little thumbs up. I don't know if anybody saw it, but I was listening when you said that. Okay, so great. Thank you. I needed that. Yeah. Excellent. Anybody else want to respond? Okay. You had a question. Thank you. Little boy had his hand up. I don't know whether you want to talk. <laughs> Do you want to talk? She had her hand. Yeah, we're over here, and then here, and then you can talk, okay? <laughs> um, so going back to what we were talking about before with like the gender people in schools and stuff, um, I'm, a, I'm Sierra, I'm a junior here at the high school. Um, I'm uh, queer and non-binary, um, and I've talked to a lot of my peers who constantly deal with being misgendered like every day in school. Um, 
And I think a big part of it is like, they've just lost faith in the system completely. And when it happens, they're like, oh, well, there's nothing they can do about it. Like, if, they feel like if they can report it to somebody, nothing's gonna be done, which has caused them to stop reporting. Um, so I don't know like how we can then get students to feel comfortable to start reporting these things again when they've just completely lost faith in the system. And I feel like that shouldn't be put on the students to somehow get faith back um, just so they can start reporting things again. Like there has to be more done because I know so many people do not feel comfortable. Um, I'm just thinking about my experiences. I'm new to the school this year. I previously attended U32 in Montpelier. Um, and just the, it really it sort of like opened my eyes to how a lot of people perceive Vermont as this very progressive state that's absolved of a lot of many problems. Um, but like coming here, I realized like, that's not true at all. Um, and just the environment shift that I have experienced coming here has made me realize that like, there are really places in the state that I do not feel safe to like fully be out to people. Um, and this sort of town being one of those places, um, I think it's just really important to acknowledge how like, well, we may perceive Vermont as this like liberal safe haven or whatever, it's really not. <laughs> and while it is better than some other states in the country, like thinking about all we've heard so many things already, um, it's like it's important to like really remember that. I feel like all this is sort of just, I feel like more people should be aware of that. Thank you. I'm an educator here for OSSD and for Two Rivers Supervisory Union in the Ludlow area. And I'm speaking on behalf of some students and families that I work with who have experienced discrimination. Um, sorry. And one um, reported an incident years ago. It was probably in 2018, 2019. Of hearing a comment while walking down the hallway in earshot of another student who said, I wish I could shoot all of the, what the race was. And in response to administration finding out, rather than really kind of pursuing it with a hard line, um, they were trying to protect the other student in one sense because he suffered from mental illness. Um, it came out later that there were actually guns in the home and this other student, I think, tried to shoot his father. Um, I think that was what the news report was. And so the family to which, of the student who had heard this comment, after hearing that, there was, before and after hearing that, there was just a lot of fear. There was um, the student that I knew and I'm speaking on behalf of was not sleeping, was not feeling safe at school, and not feeling safe in the community, nor was his family. And that same student at VTC this year experienced a teacher asking and a question that was just not appropriate. And rather than saying something to the teacher or having a discussion or some sort of justice circle with the teacher, they simply offered, if you're not comfortable, can we just change you to another class? And so these are things that are happening, that are being reported and just not being followed up on sufficiently whatsoever. The reporting, it's great to have the reporting, but when people are so few in number in a community, it's very, very difficult to feel safe reporting because anything that happens as a result of that reporting will then have backlash on the students and potentially on their families. And so I often hear about these things and I have to ask my students if I can report it and they will say, no, I don't want you to report it. So I say, can I report it anonymously and not reveal you or the exact situation so that I can just let it be known to the administration that this is going on and they will say yes. And so I'll do it that way. But that's because they fear backlash on any reporting. And so something maybe not in the community as a way to report. So like I've referred people to the state level anonymous reporting. And I think that maybe trying to further that more 
and go through that channel and back in is a safer way for a lot of kids and families. Thank you. Aton, did you want to go with the comment and then we have our little Yes, to yes, I do. Um, and this is in response to the statement I read just a bit ago. Um, this person writes, my concern is that the people that need to hear this are perhaps not present in conversations like this one happening now. Um, suggestions for increasing empathy from these people who are often not part of the dialogue, and that's a question. Um, my assumption is, are there suggestions from anyone for increasing empathy from these people who are often not part of the dialogue? That's it. Was that a rhetorical question? Um, I don't think it is, actually. So the question I, is, what can be done to increase the empathy of the people who need to hear this but aren't in this room? Right. And not participating in this kind of a conversation. Isn't that the million dollar question? This was my comment. My name is Katie Van Houten. Hi, Katie. And I'm an educator um, and parent as well of kids in the district. Um, it just feels like a lot of times people are here when they're riled up about something. And if the, if the meeting has a, a banner of um, something to do with our mascot or something to do with locker rooms or bathrooms, you get all this turnout and then they're there to listen, but instead it becomes sort of, it, it's not a productive conversation. But if you advertise it in the way that this one was advertised, you get a different, do you see what I'm saying? Okay, you're, you're nodding, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. You get a different crowd when you advertise like this. You get the crowd okay. that's actually interested and concerned about what goes on with people who are LGBT, et cetera. Um, yeah. They're gonna show up. I mean, in a certain sense, it's a self-selecting group. I think that's where you're going, yes? It is, and also just wondering like, where do you go from there? Um, right. I also just while I have the, the space here, I don't want to take any more time. Um, but hearing from the student that just spoke, super powerful. So just thank you so much. And it's such a good reference when you hear of a student coming from a different school, because what we hear is this is everywhere. And I don't believe that it is everywhere at this caliber. Mm. So thank you to that student who spoke. Thank you. And to reiterate what our student said was, why is it our job to come to you to report? Why do we have to do even more, right? When we are the least protected, the most vulnerable, and with the least resources? Yeah, I love that question. We have another young person. Let's see if they'll talk. Hi, do you wanna talk? What is it like to be here? To be... Um. Don't worry, you did great. Let's give a round of applause to our youngest participant ever. Nicely done. You probably have a better time getting up off the floor. Okay. So, one theme we hear a lot in these forums, and it's coming out tonight here too, is a sense of dissatisfaction with the response by the government. And I just want to give a plug for more use of restorative approaches. Our community member over here mentioned that maybe there could be a circle response of some kind. But we hear this in a lot of communities that uh, uh, maybe a more of a grassroots or ground up approach that restorative justice can provide would really be welcome. And in a restorative 
conference or circle or conversation, there are certain questions that are asked that I think communities really could stand to benefit from. One question is, what was the harm? How were you harmed? What happened to you? What did that feel like? Why were you harmed? Why was that harmful? Another question is, how can we help address the harm? What do you need? And Tabitha's question that she wrote on the board goes to this too. Tabitha wrote down, what do you need in order to trust that you can report issues? A third question is, whose responsibility is it to help address the harm? And that goes to something else we hear about a lot, that it's not, it's not the harmed person's responsibility to address how the harm is fixed. It's not the harmed person's responsibility to get accountability for what happened. It's all of our responsibilities and sometimes the typical criminal justice system or, or um, a punishment approach is just not satisfying or maybe it just can't happen because of that bottom part of the pyramid. It doesn't mean communities can't do something to address the harm that we're all experiencing and that some of us are experiencing a lot more than others. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to talk just a little bit about the restorative opportunities in this community? I honestly, are there folks here who, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Anderson, and I'm the director of the Orange Director of Reentry Services for the Orange County Restorative Justice Center. And um, it was nice to see so many people here and not have it be screaming, uh, which for you folks from the state is very unusual for us. Um, we offer our services for any of the, the community uh, conversations that have been put out here today. Uh, I will say that in Orange County, I've worked uh, for about 11 years doing reentry and reparative and diversion. And I do not think that I have met a person in a minority group ha who has not been victimized because of who they are not one, and um, I would say multiple times in their home area. Um, our work is to support them to do whatever they're comfortable doing, and I'm sitting here thinking about, and every time I work on one of these cases, I'm thinking about what could more could we be doing. And so um, I offer to everybody here, if you have ideas of how we could better integrate with the criminal justice system, we're open to that. We work very closely on these cases with our prosecutor and the courts, but we're always looking for more when people don't, aren't comfortable coming forward. And um, we see a lot of these cases. And um, I'm so glad to see some folks here that I've worked with, and I'm just appreciative that people are willing to come out again and again to say the same things. Thank you. A couple of uh, quick things. We have somebody in the um, chat. Yeah, I see. So we have a question that we want to pose, which is, what do you need in order to trust that you can report issues? So that's something just to keep in your mind as we're, as we're having this conversation and thinking about what you said about a fractured community. Um, and like I said, Randolph has been on one heck of a ride this year. Um, so think about what it is that you need to start to heal that. One last quick comment, and I meant to put it as kind of a community reminder. People who are victimized are not victimized because of who they are. They are victimized because somebody else believes that they have the right to harm them based on that person's own beliefs about that person's identity group. So if I get hurt, it's not because I'm a black woman. It's because you think that I'm less than. So we want to make sure that we're putting responsibility where it, where it belongs. Um, we have one comment on the chat, and then we're going to come to you. Yeah. Um, could we unmute?
um, Mr. Belowski again. He's got another Give question. Yep. Uh, I was just wondering, I, I've written a lot of reports over the years, even before all the shutdowns and COVID actually, I'm thinking like five or six years ago even, um, state and local law enforcement agencies have really been hurting for staff. And I imagine that impacts their ability to respond to all sorts of situations, um, including the concerns that we're hearing about tonight. Um, can, can somebody, anyone from the law enforcement uh, realm there tonight speak to how this presents challenges and, and what's being done to try to address it? Thank you. Good question. He's like, I'm a reporter. Of course, it's a good question. <laughs> Anybody from our law enforcement folks have a response for that? Are we seeing a dearth in uh, law enforcement's capacity to respond to the issues that we're hearing tonight? So Mia is saying that murder should be a priority for law enforcement, regardless of staffing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Tabitha? I didn't quite get that. Mia said that murder should be a priority for law enforcement. Ah, yes. But I think, uh, Michael, if I was hearing you correctly, you wanted to hear from the law enforcement folks here? Right. Um, well, I just uh, reported, yeah, over the years and like uh, select board meetings and municipal meetings and the, also the state police um, who often deal with those entities, uh, they're just all short. And this was going on like before the, um, you know, before COVID even, I remember just writing for the local paper. So um, I, I just imagine it creates challenges and, you know, for responding for uh, these, these types of crimes. Or concerns. Anyone? Um, can I speak, Katie Van Houten online? Sure. Oh. Um, I think staffing shortages are an issue across the board, including in the schools. So I think it's our new normal and we just have to move on from it. I don't want to be quoted for this. Um, and 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 I'd love it if this could be like brought back more to the local level of like the Randolph Orange County community situations that we're struggling with. I, I think it's a bit of a mistake to uh, get, get into the mold of thinking that the sole responsibility for public safety are uh, people who are, are sworn and carry guns. Uh, the public has always been a co-partner in public safety, and I think our experience in working with law enforcement at the state level, because I'm in the Attorney General's office, is that we've seen a greater willingness uh, uh, or an opening up of relying more heavily on community uh, participation in dealing with conflict. We're, we're in a room full of people here who don't, uh, who, who, do, who are part of making communities safer for people so that they can pursue what we all want to pursue, which is to grow and, and, and raise our families and be our best selves. And um, so there are always going to be more of us in the community than there are going to be people in police cars or, or, or riding desks working cases. and. Part of what we're trying to do with the bias incident reporting system and talking with the communities is to enlist your help. Uh, we need your help. We need to know where the problems are. We need to find people who have skills that we don't have in community and restorative justice and work on the issues that way. It's not as it's not a single solution. There are just different parts, and that includes education, that includes employment, housing, dealing with the business community. Um, civic leaders, community groups, we relied very heavily on the NAACP, as Mia's right next to me. Uh, we're so indebted to the information and the problem solving that uh, they bring to, to problems because a lot of the times we've been saying from the beginning, we are not the right people. Um, but um, the other thing I want to say about why bias incidents are dealing with this is so important. Uh, and this is something that we teach in the police academy, which is that a hate crime or a bias 
incident is a fear multiplier. An attack on one is an attack on many, an attack on all in that community. Um, that's true regardless of what group you're talking about. If someone is attacked because someone has difficulty getting along with somebody because of the way they present themselves to the world, that's felt by the family, by the neighbors, by coworkers, classmates, it's felt by everyone. That's part of the reason why in the criminal justice system, you have a certain punishment for a crime, but if it's a hate crime, it's a higher level of punishment. It's because the impact on the community is felt more deeply and, and lasts longer. And so I think regardless of what our resources are, we could always use more. Um, our greatest resource for learning about uh, what's going on and if there's a criminal investigation, having people cooperate with the investigation, whether they're witnesses or they know where witnesses or evidence is, or working with us trying to find the right, right way to, to resolve a conflict that lies outside of the court system. Um, I, just, I, I just think we need to get out of the mindset that we have certain people who dress in uniform or dress in suits like me and we're the ones that we're supposed to do it. Um, we can't do it alone, that's why we're here. Um, in regard to answering that question in another way, um, I would like to introduce my partner, the other co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs for the State Police, Captain Barbara Kessler. Um, Captain, uh, can we unmute her first off and give her the floor? You're hi there, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, hi, so yeah, I'm Captain Kessler, uh, Aton's partner with the Fair and Impartial Policing Unit. And I just wanna mention for the staffing issues, um, yes, it's been very difficult for us and all police departments but staffing issues don't change our job descriptions or our duties. Um, and we don't define our response to crimes by people's race or gender or ethnicity. Um, so we respond as best we can to all complaints and you know, the, the crimes that we can enforce and you know, take action on, we arrest and take action on. Um, our response times might be a little slower because you're dealing with someone who might be further away um, there might not be a closer trooper, but other than that, um, I, I don't think it really affects these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good one. After it turns green, wait a second or you'll be disappointed. Okay. Now. Yeah. <clears throat> That question on the board, um, I'll bring it right to a personal level of my grandson and other students here at Randolph Union High School. Um, if someone could get to know at a, a, a kind of a one-on-one -on -one level In a, in a more personal conversation in school where the kids that are transgender and the kids who come from families where their religious position is very strongly against the possibility of transgender life. Um, I've, I've heard um, you know, you hear, you're, you're biologically born a boy, that's what you are, okay. So that's a very deep, personal, religious belief. And then there are the transgender folks, like my grandson, who is working um, very hard to be true to who he believes he is in his heart. But if there's no chance to talk one-on-one -on -one in school um, with each other as people, it's just these ideologies that are fighting against each other, not the human beings. And 
the need for respect. Maybe those sides are never going to come to a, a spot where they agree. And that has to be okay. I mean, that's part of life. But respect so that safety is preserved for both. Um, that's where my heart is breaking for what's happening here at the high school. And fear of reporting your um, mid being misgendered. I don't know all the technology I'm learning. I have to pay 25 cents every time I say the wrong pronoun, <laughs> which is just fine. Um, one of my grandchildren says, Grandma, if you were doing it on purpose, that would be true. But you're making a mistake. So 25 cents. Um, it just seems like if kids from very um, conservative religious groups could talk with kids that are living with their transgender issues over lunch and I don't know how that happens at the high school. I know there's terrific division. And I hate to see new um, private schools being advocated. Because I, mm -hmm. I've never felt good about private schools. I mean, we live in the world together. If you go to a private school where you only hear one point of view, how are we ever going to come to love each other like we should as human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very painful for the kids in the high school, very painful. Thank you anyway, for um, sharing your story. When I hear you asking for are opportunities for people to connect across difference, yeah. what those look like, oh, that's gonna be interesting. Yeah, I think it would definitely be really beneficial to like figure out ways that like we can have that open dialogue, I think. But going about that, I think, can be a little tricky. Um, one, because I know we want to put students um, in the position of having to educate their peers, um, at least off the bat, because that can be very uncomfortable being like put in a situation where you're talking with somebody who may not like agree with who you are. Um, but I think like there definitely should be ways that we start implementing just like normalizing these things, like curriculum. Um, I think education is extremely important when addressing these issues, um, and I feel like maybe a good way to start would be just implementing things in curriculum like I don't know, reading books by trans authors about trans experiences or something like that just to like humanize people and expose um, like these identities to people um, without like necessarily having to put students in the position of educating others because that can be tricky and very like emotionally taxing. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there should be ways that we should be able to start implementing it. I would love to see that in the school. Um, I don't know how that would happen, but it should. Yeah. So we have a way, we just got to figure out the what. Mia, and then a question online? Yep. I'm trying to find, take space, make space. I'm not trying to take too much space, but I, I just wanted to um, comment that this is, cultural, right? And I think at the beginning, you were talking about, we never had a white house like this. I would venture to say you did. It was just not, the generation wasn't speaking up. They were taking it. And now we have a new generation of people who are voicing their identities. They're proud of the, who they are, and they don't want to have to just take it anymore. So there's that going on. And so anytime you push against what's been normalized, you're gonna see some pushback. That's, you know, what we know. And I know that this community has had conversations. I've been part of some of those conversations. And we've asked some of these things. And a lot of times it um, falls on a lot of deaf ears, I feel. Like I'm using my I statement. That, um, there's a sense of this is too hard. There's too much pushback. We have to listen to everybody's perspective on this. But when it comes to our humanity, 
do we need to listen to all of their hateful perspectives? Or do we just make the choice as people who have power in our communities to ensure that all the students are safe and we do that hard work and we listen to our students who say, I don't feel safe reporting to you. Here's what I need to feel safe and make that happen and not push that back. And then whatever they have to say, you believe them and you validate them and you put things in place to ensure that they have safety regardless of the noise around you saying that this can't happen or this shouldn't happen. So that, that's my little soapbox because it's really a cultural thing and it has been happening. We just have people now who want to say something and don't want to put up with it anymore. Mm. Thank you, Matt. Hey, Tom, online? Yes, um, if we could unmute Tony Cortez, he has his hand up for a question, please. Um, hi, uh, am I unmuted? You are. Yes, you are. Oh, fantastic. Okay, um, so uh, I am the uh, DEI coordinator um, for a independent school in Vermont. Um, I am also an alum of that school. Um, I'm biracial, I'm transgender. Um, I am, I'm in my early thirties and I connect with kids in a way that I focus on relationship building as well as um, focusing on restorative justice, uh, implementation of like practices and ways that um, th that can, in that can build community um, based on repairing harm that's done and, and the needs that are created from harm. So I think uh, for those who are looking at solutions, I, I think that there, there are solutions. Um, there is hope for change. Uh, so I, I would just say like, I think there's positive aspects to this too, is the fact that we have youth out there that are looking to relationship build with each other. You know, COVID really did a really big hit on them um educationally you know academically uh socially um and i think taking that and putting yourselves in their shoes is like their experience through covid and their experiences and what's happened in the past few years um also politically um and so socially uh it, it has really made a, a shift in the in their experience academically it's way different than my experience um so i'd just say you know take those things in consideration too um, and also when we talk about, uh, gender and gender identity, I think a piece of it too, is also recognizing that some people experience, uh, multiple forms of trauma, um, and also like, uh, disprivilege in a sense, like disprivilege, um, you know, based on their ability or their race. Um, so those are some things that I want to just shed light on too, when we talk about gender identity and the trans community. Um, I also want to shed light on the trans community that are people of color um, that have an experience that uh, is different than, you know, my, my own and some others. Um, so I just want to, you know, touch base on that one. Um, but yeah, I think that supporting students in the best way you can by relationship building and really meeting them on an empathy level, no matter what their background is too. Like I have students have different political perspectives in mind, but I have really good relationships with them as far as talking about fishing or things that we have in common um, and building those relationships. And I think it's about building community by just looking at the root of like, what is community and reminding ourselves that as well as addressing those, those topics is like, why is something appropriate and not appropriate? And what harm does that cause or needs that, that it creates? Um, but that's just my say. Um, but I hope you all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Important points about building community. So as we look to build community, I just want to revisit our, our thoughts here about how or what do we need in order to trust that you can report issues or be able to talk 
with the folks in this room about issues that are happening. to reflect back two things that I've heard. Um, one is that uh, folks sometimes don't report because they don't believe something will be done. Um, and one is that folks are not reporting, especially in a small community, um, because they're worried about, about blowback on themselves. So there's fear um, that something will be done and that it'll come back, bounce back on them. And there's a fear that nothing will be done. So I'm just like, I want to kind of articulate what I've heard folks say in case it's helpful and spurring um, further discussion. A question for me sitting in like the government role is um, something is happening like, how do we show our work to the community in a way that's meaningful? Um, and, and what assurances or what protections could we be talking about that might make that fear of reporting and the fear of blowback dissipate a little bit. Some more things to think about. Uh, question in the chat and then we'll come over here. Yes, and this is from Tevya Kalman. So if we could unmute them, that would be very helpful. Am I unmuted? You yeah. are indeed. I, Eitan, I just want to compliment you on your pronunciation of my name. Not many people get that right the first time. Oh. So, well, well Thank done. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm a teacher at the high school. I guess what I had wanted to say was actually related to something that said earlier. So this isn't a direct response to the question on the table. But, um, you know, I think there is some discussion of like, how can we foster an environment in the in the schools where students coming from different perspectives feel more comfortable just kind of learning from each other directly and, and being in space to each other. Um, and I think Sierra, you brought up some of the very real obstacles to that. While I think also, you know, I think we're all agreeing that that's like what we want to see. Um, one perspective I just wanted to offer like from my work as a teacher is that I feel like that insight was one that I feel like we were coming to maybe five or six years back in this, dis in this district. Um, and that one of the things I've seen happen in the intervening five or six years is like, as our national political climate has, as the divisions that were there then have sort of evolved and, and mutated. Um, and I think also as, um, as some like national political strategies that really involve kind of attacking culture war issues specifically in schools have really come to the fore that it's been really hard to, to kind of navigate uh when everything has become politicized and i feel like one thing we need to figure out how to do as a community and as specifically as adults and leaders in the community is to, to kind of reject that partisan lens when we're talking about what we need to do as a school to keep kids safe and feeling valued. And I think just like, I had this more clearly articulated in my head, but you know, I, I don't know exactly how to do that, but it seems that being really clear that that's the goal and as an institution, and I think many institutions in our community have a role to play in this of, of sort of insisting that when we're talking about, you know, what do trans kids or kids of color or kids um, from low income families or any other group of people who we know are going to experience hardships accessing their education because of the society we live in, we need, we need to have confidence as educators that we can do what in our professional opinion is needed knowing that that's not going to be seen as some sort of inappropriate political maneuvering. Um, and, and so I think I, I just wanted to name that aspect of the problem of, of sort of figuring out how to rise above that sort of part, you know, partisan um, approach and, and to really remember that like the purpose of a school is to take any kid who walks in the door 
and give them the tools to learn as much as they can and be the best version of them, themselves going forward. Um, and yeah, how to just center that part of our mission when we're talking about these things that we know are, are going to be viewed through that political lens. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, there you go. Now wait a sec for it. Yep, go ahead. Um, I'm involved with a church youth group. And I know that our church youth group has been a forum where children who have had trouble in school have been able to say to their friends that youth group was a small group. This happened to me. And got the result. Why didn't you tell us? We are your friends. So what I would say, excuse me, what I would say is that we encourage our children to gather a small group of friends. And when something bad happens, they take their friends with them to report what happened. So they are not alone in confronting authority. Thank you. You want to open it up? Any other things folks would like to share? There's a lot to say, but not so much. Sometimes it's hard to say it. Sorry. <laughs> I've been in this community well, working within the school district for almost 20 years. I made a commitment. And a couple years ago, I bought a house here. And I think one thing that I need to see from my community, and whether it is my school community or other stakeholders in the community, is we as grown-ups need to commit to our anti-bias and anti-racism work. We need to, every staff member in here, not just folks in a classroom, not just people who opt in and out, every business from Gifford to any of our big, big employers, we need to make a commitment to delve into anti-bias work and anti-racism work it does not have to be tied to an ideology. It's about doing the right thing. It's about creating a safe environment. And we cannot put it on our children to navigate and advocate for these things if we're not stepping up. I've been part of community groups with Mia when only three of us showed up. So I'm challenging all of us, and I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces here. So I know a lot of you have dug in and done the work. I'm imploring and begging that you bring three or four other people you know to the next community listening session that we have. But more importantly, that we admit that we are part of the problem too. And we have a lot of work to do. I benefited from this system. I'm a white, middle-class woman. I could have decided tonight not to come here and actually thought about it as I was coming back from a meeting up in Montpelier. And I'm like, who am I to go back to my house when I'm a minute away from here? So please, we as stakeholders in this community, we need to invest in the work. And it, only is going to happen if we all are standing up. And it's hard, but I'm not okay with leaving this on our kids' backs. Thank you. You got the lead. The people that agree with you very much there. Thank you. Um, I want to pull some of what I'm hearing together this idea that 
There shouldn't be an argument about what's right. The ability to collaborate across difference is a critical life skill. You spoke about employers. You cannot work for a credible employer if you cannot collaborate across difference. You need to be work, able to work with people who are not like you, respect them, appreciate them for their gifts. And so as we're thinking about where can we go from here, one of those things needs to be to talk very candidly with our children, our students about this. We don't have enough diversity here. We're actually diverse poor. We are incredibly lacking. It's very hard to have a celebration of diversity here because we have so little. So we need to take what we have here and celebrate the diversity we have and teach our students to work together so they're prepared for a global economy. Because in the world, they're gonna come across a lot more difference than they're seeing here. Thank you. I would note a lot of people with diverse backgrounds leave here. Increasing your diverse poor. I'll just say that because it's not sustainable. I can name three from this community. Just this one, not across the state. Just this one. So they can't stay here because there's not safety here, then you're gonna continue this cycle. And you're not going to prepare your white kids for a global majority world. So, thank you. Or our cisgender children, or heterosexual children. Anyone? Anything else? <laughs> I, think, I think that's a wrap. <laughs> I need Gabby. Anything else from our friends online or anyone in the room would like to add something before we close out? Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Steph Leonard. I work in the school district, and um, I'm going to be with some of the sentiments that were said here. Um, I love that we have this in the community, but after everything dies down, um, the people that show up are obviously not the ones that need to be here. And I would love um, to see education start at a school age level, just because that's where you need to reach them. Otherwise, it continues to be a multi-generational bias. Um, they've done studies in racially diverse schools. You know, some people think that, oh, like kids are colorblind. If you grow up around it, you're not gonna see it. And they've actually found that even in the most racially diverse schools, there is inherent racism. And the only thing that made a difference was deliberate conversations. So we need to start having those conversations with kids from the time that they're young. Um, and they have to be pointed and they have to be deliberate. They're not just gonna happen. So I think that within our school systems, we need to start having those conversations. And they're gonna be painful and there's gonna be you know, community issues related to that. There's gonna be backlash. Um, but that's what gets people talking. And that's the only way that you're going to deal with these problems. So En Vogue was wrong. Freeing your mind and being colorblind has not allowed the rest to follow. <laughs> I think something that's important, and I think something that I would like to see is um, people of power not walking a line of I need to please everybody um, because I think when that happens the change that's actually needed does not happen so if we're like oh we need to have more education about these issues in classes but if 
the people who can make those changes happen are too scared of, say, backlash from parents, then it's not going to happen. So I think something that like students need to, as a community needs to see, is the people who have the power using their power to make a change. Mm. I'm with you. Did I see somebody else? Yes. I just had a question about the pyramid. Um, could I get examples of the difference, some maybe multiple examples of the difference between hate crime and civil rights violations? I understand, you know, damage to property or hurting someone, but what are some other examples of that? So, so a hate crime, again, you have to have crime. It might be an act of violence, it might be theft. Um, you've heard throughout the state people having Black Lives Matter or pride flags destroyed or, or <laughs> stolen. Those are crimes. Um, and if they're done because of bias against the person who's victimized, you have a hate crime. But you have other things that may happen in work where someone is speaking in a way that is racist, sexist, transphobic, etc. Those words that under the First Amendment are not crimes. But under our federal laws and our state laws, we have the right to have an equal opportunity to work and pursue our professions. And so there are laws that we enforce, and the U.S. Attorney's Office enforces, that will protect people from harassment at work based upon you know, vicious images or, or slurs, um, uh, any number of types of harassment that themselves are not criminal. Um, and uh, so that's a civil violation. You can come to our office if you have that experience at work and we can investigate the employer in Vermont. Individual harassers are subject to court action, not just the employer. Um, so that would be one. Another would be, in, let's say, in housing. If you live in an apartment building and you have a racist neighbor who's harassing you, saying terrible things about you or your family, and those words are not crimes they're because they're not threats against your life, but they accumulate to, de to deny you your chance to have fair housing like everyone else. And so at the federal level and the Human Rights Commission at the state level, again, they have the ability to take your complaint. And if your landlord isn't making you safe, they can take the landlord to court and get a court order and get in order to require certain things to happen to make the environment safe. And if you've suffered damage, which, which could be property damage, it could be the stress you experience. Uh, some people have to feel like they have to move or they have to move. Those moving expenses, you can get those uh, in an award in court. So those are two examples of civil violations. Can I ask a follow-up question? Please. Um, just, I think it's my understanding that I understand the examples you gave. However, if you were to speak up about something and um, say people are driving past your house repeatedly late at night laying on their horn or screaming at you repeatedly because you spoke out about something or acting in a, in a har you know, harassing you in that way, Vermont has nothing to help you with that as a, like if you're in your house and you experience that from something that you said or did to try to make things better? Well, for that specific example, if people are being harassed in their homes because uh, people are, are you know, uh, communicating their hatred at someone who lives in the neighborhood, that itself can be a type of housing discrimination. And uh, uh, Jules Torty's office, at the U.S. Attorney's Office has actually taken some housing cases including one more recently that was criminal. I don't know if you want to talk about that one, at least what you can talk about. Yeah, so um, exactly what you described is tricky, right? Because we talk about um, this pyramid, pyramid and I use the words like 
identity a lot, like protected characteristics. So the law does limit, um, when you're talking about hate crimes or civil rights violation, the bad thing that happens uh, usually has to be tied to some part of your identity, your sex, your gender identity, sexual orientation, your race, your national origin, something like that. The law does not prevent, protect like activist status. So if you're saying I'm being targeted because I'm a person who's like a rabble rouser in my community and I spoke up and I'm getting a lot of harassment, um, it, that probably wouldn't fall under the frameworks that we have for hate crimes or civil rights violations. Um, it's still illegal to be kind of har harassed in, in that way, in a, under, I, I don't want to speak for state law, but in a sort of targeted way. So um, it's just because something isn't a hate crime or isn't a civil rights violation, it doesn't mean it's legal. There are other laws too, they tell me. Um, uh, but under the, the civil rights frameworks, um, no, it, that probably is a gap. Um, this is my chance to say the laws are what we say they are. Laws are passed by human people who are elected. Um, and so, you know, if we think that's a gap in the law, advocacy is the route. Neil. This time I'm not scratching my ear. The last time I inadvertently made a move in my hand, I happened to be sitting in an auction and it cost me $10,000. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> the, the point was made earlier and it's true that we're kind of talking to the choir here. And there are a lot of people that should hear this message and don't hear it, don't want to hear it probably. I think the dialogue here tonight has been wonderful, quite frankly. And I really hope that it gets excellent broad coverage in the local newspaper and any of the other local medias. Uh, it is important for the community to know that this went on and what kinds of things are going on. It's in the family for just a second. This woman over here, and I'm not sure what your name is, but you're right. It's not the kids' problem. It's our problems. And I'm going to bring this up, and he'll probably shoot me after to say it. I'm going to volunteer for one more thing. There's a program called Reading to End Racism, and it starts with children in the grammar school. I have the people that I can contact, and if anybody in this room is interested, or thinks that you know somebody that might be, it's a volunteer kind of thing, and the schools have to agree to do it. So we would have to get the elementary school here to say yes, that they would work with it. We're in the phone book, if you still have one of the old Randolph phone books. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you. It's 728-3474. If you have people that like to read to kids, Stephanie's right. We have to start while, while they're young. So if you're interested, let me know, and I'll get in touch with those folks, and we can get something going. Tell them about the time we went to the school. Oh, yeah. We, we went up in Plainfield, and we sat in because we thought that we were going to do it at the time, and then we, we started something else. But at any rate, it, it was in a, a grammar school there, and the principal came out, and it was through grade six. Every single class brought their kids out, and they came in with the youngest first, and they went into the cafeteria like this, and they sat all around, and the principal started out talking very gently to all of them, and he said, what are the three things that we're here for? And one of them was so that we can learn new things, and the other thing was so that we can make new friends, and the third thing was because we all are special. And every one of those kids sat in their classrooms and had volunteers read stories to them. And the Reading to End Racism group has a mountain of books. And I'm sure that in our own library, we have a lot of those books that, that we could start with. But it was just, it was very moving. And it was too far away at that point for us to get involved in. But thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Yeah, it's never kids that are the problem, it's us. 
Uh, I'm Charity Clark, uh, Vermont Attorney General, and I didn't want to take time talking, but I see we're almost at the end of our evening, and I just wanted to take a moment to say how much I appreciate everyone who came out tonight and this conversation, which has just been so honestly inspiring. It was so respectful. I learned a lot. Um, and those of us who do this work, this is almost a relief for us to be go into the community and talk to you all about the work and hear what you're seeing, what you're experience and what you're experiencing, your feelings, and also your great ideas. So this was really a wonderful night for me, and I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of your participation and um, great comments. So thank you. Thanks, Charity. We have to wrap it up now. I just have one quick comment before I um, turn it back over to Aton for our closing comments and can agree more that this has been a really um, fruitful conversation. Um, and I know it's not easy to come out and talk about such difficult, painful things and hope that this will be the time that something changes for you. But we appreciate you coming out today. I'm gonna leave you with a quote that kind of reminds me, I, in each of these sessions, I am listening to what people are saying. So I, I have one of my favorite quotes by James Baldwin that really, to me, reminds me of what I'm hearing tonight. We can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. We get to be different. You can hate whoever you want, but what you don't get to do is impede on somebody else's ability to live. Hey, Tom? Okay. This has been very interesting. In most of the fora that we've done thus far, um, we've heard a lot generally from the various government actors who have been participating in this. And um, this forum has been really quite different. They, um, the government actors have been much more subdued for good reason than um, in other fora that we've done. I really think that tells us something. I think it says that the answers are what you've all already come up with, at least the the direction of the answers are is alluded to by what you've all come up with and that broadly that can be said to be education and i am heartened and uh thrilled by hearing that that's that people are talking about anti-racist uh curricula um which are not necessarily ideologically based um, I would have loved that. I came of age as a gay man during the AIDS epidemic. Um, I'm that old. Uh, it was a horrible time. There were similar things going on. It's just that that moment, everyone was attacking gay people who were clearly just disease carriers. Um, the people who ended up saving me, not so much in high school, but at a very conservative college that I went to, were in fact the educators who got together and sat down and went, it's on us. We have to teach our students not to do what they're doing. And it worked and it worked. And there are teachers to whom I will forever be grateful. So it's wonderful that long various governmental functions are here and are willing to help and able to help in certain circumstances. But as they can even say, there's only so much they can do. What is thrilling to me is hearing the dedication of all of you who are educators to take the burden off of the kids and put it on the people who can actually hold it and who can transform the situation entirely. And I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how this comes. Thanks, Satan, and happy National Teacher Appreciation Week. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for being here. We're going to stay around for a little bit, so if folks have anything online or um, you'd like to interact with any of our folks from the government, please stay around. Otherwise, have a great night. Thank you all. Thank you.